Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, happy Tuesday, hope you all are doing well. Uh, we're here for our seventh uh, installation of our webinar series and uh, the second part of our two-part series about uh, restoration on private lands. Uh, we have a great lineup for you. Um, uh, welcome, I'm, I'm Rusty Lloyd, I'm the Executive Director of Rivers Edge West, and uh, Rivers Edge West is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to advance riparian lands through collaboration, education, and technical assistance. So uh, in light of the COVID situation, we're trying to provide uh, information workshops, invite guest speakers and experts to provide that information to you all so we can make uh, overall better impacts on our restoration efforts on the ground. So I'd like to introduce our, our three presenters today. First off, we're going to hear from Shelly Simmons, who's uh, the coordinator for the Purgatory Watershed Weed Management Collaborative, uh, doing great work out on the eastern uh, side of Colorado, have done a lot of great work. Uh, exciting to hear uh, from Shelly. Second, we're going to hear from Kelsey Holloway, who's a private lands biologist, for the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies and a partner in partnership with the uh, NRCS Natural Resource Conservation Service. So we're going to hear a little bit about uh, restoring for avian uh, and, and bird uh, habitat. Then uh, finishing up, we're going to hear from Nina Loudon, who is uh, works with the Colorado Department of Agriculture here on the West Slope at the Palisade Insectary um, uh, that uh, Propagates a lot of the biological controls that we have uh, that we can use for um, uh, different different weed species. So that's the lineup. I think we're going to have some great presentations. I uh, can't wait to hear the the information, and uh, we'll get to your questions and answers at the end of this session. Um, we also have a number of uh, Rivers Edge West staff on on the line here um, that will help answer questions or send links to everyone uh, for some of the information that is presented. So uh, I think with that, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll turn it over to Shelly Simmons uh, with the Purgatory Water Weed Management Collaborative. So thanks for joining us, Shelly. Thanks, Rusty. Um, thanks for that great introduction. And uh, so, yeah, I'm over here in the southeastern part of the state. Um, I work exclusively in Los Animas County at this point within the Purgatory uh, Watershed. Um, I am a fourth generation southeastern Coloradoan, and um, I've really been lucky to be to do my most of my career here in southeastern Colorado, where I grew up and where my family's at. Um, and I was counting up all my years of experience. <laughs> Really, it's just shy of about 20 years, about 18 years, I've been doing work on private lands uh, through this. I worked for the State Forest Service for quite a while, and then now working with this uh, Weed Collaborative, which is um, the Noxious Weed Program of the Spanish Peaks Purgatory River Conservation District. So I'm excited to be here. If any of you saw my presentation at the Rivers Edge uh, West conference this year, it's very similar, um, but it is there, there are some new things that I thought I'd throw in there. Um, so really, this presentation uh, is based on my experience. I'm no expert in anything. I'm not a social scientist, but this is just absolutely based on my years of experience and working with private landowners, uh, getting uh, projects done on private land. So let's hope my... Okay. So here are some wonderful views of southeastern Colorado. Um, it's a really diverse uh, landscape, especially within the Purgatory Watershed. Um, we've got uh, lots of riparian corridors. Uh, the Purgatory River um, is, is obviously the, the main uh, water channel that goes through the, the watershed, but tons of tributaries. Um, wide open spaces, canyon land, short grass prairie. So we, we work within a diverse uh, environment. Um, here in, in this area. And it's 90, 95% privately owned. Um, and the, the biggest economic driver in our area is ag production, ag production mostly cattle, cattle production. So here's just a, a 30,000 foot view of the watershed. So over on the Western side, we've got high elevation, lots of really small acres. Uh, small acreage land ownership, lots of absentee landowners. And as you move down the watershed, um, 
more of the eastern part of Los Animas County, eastern part of the watershed, lots of large, uh, unfragmented, generationally uh, owned family cattle ranches, generally speaking. Um, so when we talk about the western watershed, we have a lot of noxious weed problems, mainly because of the, the land fragmentation. I would say a lot of the, there's, there's over 150 uh, homeowners associations in that upper watershed. Um, so a little bit of a, de I mean, there are still some ag producers up there, but it's, it's a little bit of a dem different demographic than in the Eastern watershed. And around Trinidad honey areas, where you see Trinidad there in the middle, lots of little irrigated farms as well. So we have much more of a serious noxious weed problem in that upper watershed as compared to the Eastern watershed. Um, so, like I said, ag production is the uh, primary uh, economic driver in our area, and it's sustainable. It's, it's been sustainable for over 200 years. Nobody's really getting rich, but this is kind of what we do. And I, I'm lucky enough that, you know, my family, we're, we have a cow-calf operation uh, real, within the Purgatory River watershed. The Purgatory runs uh, through our ranch. So I do have an advantage that I can really relate to a lot of the people I work with. And that I'll, I'll talk about that as being maybe one of a key, uh, one of your keys to success is being able to relate to uh, whatever demographic, whatever landowners you're working with. Um, so obviously my background is, adv is advantageous to where I work now. So, but I'm gonna ask you guys to think about yourself where you work, if you're trying to work with pr private landowners and you're struggling, what are the key economic drivers in those areas? What seems to be uh, dominating land use? Uh, what are people doing? And try to develop your, your programs to kind of fit uh, what's going on in the community around you. And don't assume that all landowners' priorities are going to align with yours. Um, you might, you might have, you know, there's other ag producers I work with that, you know, I, we might have differences of opinion, but that's the key is to listen to and respect what, what your landowners value and work within that framework. Um, and it doesn't always, success doesn't always actually mean that you will implement a program or a project on their land, but really how I see success is, is developing a good relationship with all landowners, regardless of whether they're participating in your program and maybe at some point later on, they, they actually will participate. Um, the one thing I will warn against is if you are morally <laughs> opposed to how people are, are managing their land or you don't agree with what they're doing, how they make a living, what's going on, you know, that's going to shine through. Even if you don't say it directly, um, you need to really put your biases aside and just uh, just work with, with those landowners and, and respect what they're doing um, on their land. So how we've kind of aligned, we, well, we have with, with developing our, our weed collaborative, um, we thought it was very important to develop goals and actions that were aligned with the, with the main economic drivers and land use going on in our community. So obviously agricultural production is a big one, but we also have lots of recreation of hunt and hunting going on in the watershed and all that ties in with the ecology. Um, and then we really want our actions, you know, we're really about uh, not just noxious weed control, we really want to improve the land for any of those um, land uses that are going on out there. Lots of bird watching goes on in our area as well. So I'm always thinking about those different things um, uh, and how they relate to our program and, and designing our program uh, to include all the different land uses and land management that's going on in our area. So just as this is a snapshot of what we've done so far uh, since about 2005, this is all in Los Animas County in the Purgatory River watershed. The yellow areas are where we have done tamarisk and Russian olive treatments. And we've done roughly about 3,000 acres of treatments. And that's kind of gross with varying, varying percent cover. Um, within about a 90 mile uh, linear span there. So we've got on the west side there, the upper watershed clear to the east out into the eastern watershed. And um, when I look at this, it's pretty impressive. We've worked 
uh, with all of our programs and we've all actually have four different landowner programs not just our riparian restoration but we've got four uh, three others four in total uh, we've worked with over 80 landowners uh, within our collaborative and within the programs uh, within the conservation district so it's been it's been really successful and we just keep growing and have more interest all the time so how have we been able to do this um, so I talked about, you know, being respectful of landowners and, and what they value and working that within your framework, um, but but also just making sure that you're building trust with your landowners and that you recognize and adapt to their realities as well. And then you're going to establish relationships. Um, again, how they're doing things may not be how you're doing it, but you're on their land. And so you respect that fact and, and just talking to them and figuring out you know, what are their limitations uh, to doing this project work? And that will go a long ways to building trust. And I really like this, um, I guess it's a quote. I, I got this from a workshop I attended many years ago. And uh, it's really very true. When you establish trust with somebody, anybody, it doesn't even have to be, you know, a friend even, your knowledge moves quickly and informally back and forth. Um, so effective knowledge transfer is often inform in informal and <laughs> informational. I can't say that word. Improvisational. Uh, so it says human beings are seem to be hardwired hardwired to learn from personal contact with others, and that's very true. Um, so getting out there and meeting people in person, going out on their land, walking over where they want to do project work, asking them what their priorities are. That's really important. It's like my uh, power source is running out, so I, I will, my battery is running low, so I will plug in in just a minute. So I'm going to highlight options for addressing their issues um, within my programs. I'm going to make that a priority. How are we going to benefit their land? Um, and we're going to highlight our, uh, what we can input, our costs, and then also what they have to input. So we're going to be honest with them. What can we do or what we can't do for them with our programs? But we really do want to uh, emphasize the benefits of what we're going to be doing with them. But for the landowner perspective, you know, what are you looking at uh, or what are they looking at for goals for their land? A lot of times in our area, it's grazing, hunting, farming, wildlife. And then ask them what their limitations are as far as financial and time are usually the biggest limitations uh, for landowners. So building that into your program is, is really important. And then I just want to throw this in here. Um, an equally important key to our success, and this may not be possible for a lot of you, is someone who has a strong generational background within the project area um, or where you're doing work and someone who already has those established relationships. Um, so that person for me is Donna. She is my partner in crime. Um, where we're doing work right now, Donna has grown up there. Her grandparents and parents have grown up there. So people know her, they trust her. And with Donna's, that connection, that relationship, we've really been able to bring a lot more landowners on board and participate in our program. So we've just been really lucky for that. I'm from Southeastern Colorado, but I'm not specifically from the Trinidad Honey area, but Donna is. And so that's been really uh, one of our golden keys to getting so many folks on board in the last few years and in which Donna has been there. You may not be able to do that, but um, that's just something to think about if, if you can. So she's our noxious weed technician and does a lot of our on the ground work. Um, I'll try to really run through this quick because I'm sure I'm a little low on time. <laughs> but uh, part of how we've also been successful in working with landowners is how we've built our program structures. And so we've tried to really maximize uh, cash input for implementation as far as those dollars coming from the program with less cash input required from landowners. And we really get increased participation. Lots of landowners do not have the kind of supplemental income to spend on these types of projects. When you're looking at Tamaris conversion, all of costing anywhere uh, to do the, the removal and the spraying and then reveg, you know, it can push close to 2,500 $2, an acre or more. 
people just can't afford that. So if we can do that for them, that's uh, really great. And we get a lot more participation that way. Um, we also run our programs through local conservation district. Uh, and that gives us a lot more flexibility with how we spend our money, less overhead. And then we have a direct line to landowners because a lot of conservation district board members are landowners and they know other landowners. So um, we do monitoring. We, we make people sign up for a five-year commitment to do retreatments and, and, and manage their areas. And so we just try to make it easy for them and provide tools and assistance through that whole five-year period. Um, Again, cost incentive just means that we pay for most of the upfront costs and then the landowners pay for the five year responsibility of, of maintaining it. So that's always very attractive as well. Another thing we try to do, which we haven't been able to do this year, is host local workshops and forums, um, go to meetings where there are going to be local landowners involved, like conservation, other conservation districts, water conservancy organizations, uh, CSU extension, et cetera. You know, you need to go where the landowners are to the different meetings, Farm Bureau, that, those kind of places, if you want to do outreach. So again, I just want to leave you with the thought that really there's only relationships with others and practices that will either enhance that or thwart the strengthening of those relationships. Um, so sorry for the, for the battery issue. <laughs> Was not expecting that. Um, Lesson learned there, but anyway, thanks. Thanks for listening, guys, and, and I and I hope that some of this has been helpful. So, thanks, Shelley. We we really appreciate your your presentation and information on on working with landowners. Very very insightful. Um, and no problem on the on the power cord. We're all we've all been there. So uh, again, thanks for joining us. Um, so we'll uh, go ahead and turn it over to Kelsey Holloway with Birds Conservancy of the Rockies. Hey everyone, um, you can hear me all right? Yep. Awesome. Um, thanks for coming and listening to us talk today and thank you Rivers Edge West for having me here. It's kind of nice to do something different right now. Um, even though it's not in person, it's uh, nice to present. So I'm Kelsey Holloway. I'm with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. I'm a private lands wildlife biologist. And my work area is in Northeastern Colorado. I focus primarily on working with um, private landowners, ranchers and farmers to improve their habitat for uh, water birds. So today I'm going to um, talk to you a little bit about how I help manage private wetlands for birds. Bird Conservancy of the Rockies is a, a nonprofit that conserves birds and their habitats through science, education, and stewardship. Um, I'm part of our stewardship team, and there is a big group of us all the way down from New Mexico up to Montana, um, focusing on different uh, habitat types and uh, different needs in the area. Um, again, I'm wetlands, but we have range ecologists, foresters, um, et cetera. So um, we really, our stewardship team focuses on combining science and education and putting it on the ground. So we work with um, the landowners to help educate them and um, help them find the resources they might need to improve their practices on their property to uh, improve conditions for birds and for their own production. Uh, we can believe that what's good for the birds is also good for the land. Uh, we work primarily with uh, private landowners because um, they're the ones that really need the resources. And uh, it's where we've seen uh, a lot of the habitat loss across at least the United States, but beyond as well. Uh, there was a recent study out saying one in four birds has been lost since the 70s, and that's a pretty large number of birds, especially considering we've kind of um, changed 
the way we do things and we do focus on more conservation, but still seeing those losses makes it more important than ever to just continue our conservation and find new ways of um, uh, restoring habitat and helping birds. Uh, we've also seen a really dramatic decline in wetland habitat in the United States. We've lost almost half of our wetlands um, since settlement and those wetlands and riparian areas are extremely important. We see uh, the largest, uh, almost all wildlife uses wetland riparian habitats at some point in their life cycle. So the fact that we've lost half of our wetlands really shows that that could be contributing to our numbers of um, declining birds uh, in the U.S. and beyond. And private lands cover over half of the United States. So uh, we really want to focus our conservation efforts where it's going to make the biggest difference. And um, these private lands where the landowners maybe don't have um, the time or the ability to uh, learn about conservation practices um, or financially they can't afford these conservation practices. That's where we step in um, and assist in education, technical assistance and helping to find financial assistance. In the area I am in, uh, the targeted species uh, I focus on, Water birds in general, but waterfowl and shorebirds and other wetland dependent species. Uh, working with private landowners, we try and identify the species that they relate to the most, and that's gonna be largely waterfowl. They're easy to identify. A lot of the landowners are also hunters. Um, and then uh, use those, I guess, uh, keystone species to influence um, others. Uh, shorebirds are another one to get landowners interested in just because they're larger and more easy to identify. So uh, it really works out well because what um, I get to help them do on the landscape with wetlands really helps uh, other birds as well. Uh, just a little background of the area I work in. Um, I'm along the South Platte all the way from Greeley out to Julesburg. So um, all the Northeastern Plains pretty much. And the South Platte was historically just this big flood zone where um, late spring when the snow would melt, it would come flood this area and create this really shallow braided wetland habitat where lots of annual vegetation would grow. Uh, that uh, top picture shows somewhat of what it may have looked like um, historically, where you see kind of the annual vegetation growing along the stream side. Um, and by late summer, this would probably all be green wetland, seasonal wetland areas. Um, really missing a lot of the woody vegetation species. And by the end of summer, this could have dried out completely. But uh, through settlement, we have seen a crazy change in hydrology use along the South Platte. Um, people came in and we, uh, instead of, uh, <clears throat> we saw the river for how we could use it. So it turned into more of an agricultural river. It's used for canals, ditches, um, reservoirs. Uh, we learned how to drill wells and then we used augmentation to uh, restore flow to the river. And all of this has completely changed the hydrology in the area. So if you look down at that bottom right picture, that's current day South Platte. You can see it's um, a lot narrower than it would have historically been. Um, it used to be described as an inch deep and a mile wide. Um, so really shallow water wetland habitat. And now it's been channelized. So it's deeper and narrower and you see a lot more woody vegetation on the banks. Um, that's due because because of the lack of grazing from bison and um, the continuous 
high groundwater tables as well. So uh, it's been beneficial for a lot of riparian species, but other migratory birds uh, this has had somewhat negative effects. We don't get the same um, expansive wetland areas that was historically there. Um, and so that's what we are trying to create in this area or mimic what was historically there. Um, full on restoration might not be uh, a possibility, but uh, we can mimic what was historically there. So what we try and focus on for these wetlands uh, with our target species, we're looking at, I'm just going to say waterfowl, um, but all uh, migratory water birds. Um, they're looking for high value forage on their travels to their breeding grounds and down to their wintering grounds. So uh, we want to try and grow the highest value forage possible uh, during the spring and fall seasons. So this table right here shows you uh, e examples of great vegetation to grow uh, to benefit uh, waterfowl and other birds during their migratory seasons. Uh, if you look across the table, we have numbers for fat content, protein, um, and just overall what energy is provided from these species. Uh, we get a lot of smart weed and curly dock um, in this area. And here are just some examples of these species as well. Uh, here's some smart weed up here in the right hand corner. This is curly dock seed as well, floating along the surface of the water. We have some chufa, uh, some barnyard grass, some more smart weed just in a different state down here. But the diversity of these are really important. Um, we'll go back to this table. You can see the protein content is very high in certain species, but the fat content is very high in other species. So having a really diverse uh, diet, just like humans need, uh, is really important for these migrating birds. So uh, we try to create wetlands that will provide these many benefits. Um, along with plant production and seed production for health, we look at the production of invertebrates as well. Um, all the little creepy crawlies in the water are actually really important for bird species. Um, here's a table of some of the common ones found. And again, here's their energy production. And they are extremely high in protein for birds. Um, so imagine a, a female duck who's traveling north uh, to reproduce. She's going to stop over at these wetlands and really needs to fill up uh, not only for her travels, but as soon as she gets to her breeding ground, she needs to be prepared to uh, mate and reproduce. So she's got to pack on a lot of fat and protein, and that's what these invertebrates really do. They're really important for um, reproduction. So uh, the diverse vegetation will also produce diverse uh, invertebrates. And how do we create these uh, wetland systems with the diverse vegetation? Um, we don't really want the type of wetlands where there's water sitting there and then cattails are growing in it as well. That's not diverse. Um, you won't get much value. Ducks and other birds will use those areas more for loafing, but if you really want to affect them, you need to be able to manage your wetlands um, there, uh, with water manipulation. So the wetlands that we typically create are uh, very manipulated. Uh, they uh, involve creating structures to be able to raise and draw down water levels. And uh, to grow certain vegetation, it's there's kind of an art to it, um, but drawdown date is very important. Um, so if you look at table three to the left, if you have an early drawdown date, which is like March, April time, uh, you're going to grow these species here. Um, we, along the South Platte, really like this. We can grow smartweed really well. So if we do an early drawdown, we're going to get a lot of smartweed. 
but say we have a late drawdown, so maybe this is June, July-ish, we're gonna get an increase in cockleburr, which I know a lot of us have seen. Um, so depending on what species you typically see in your area, you'll wanna target your drawdown date uh, to those. Um, I promote early season, especially with the timing of uh, the migration for the birds as well. And uh, again, if you have a late drawdown, you will also typically get uh, cattail growth as well. And that's something we try to avoid in these manipulated systems. Um, over at table four, what is also important is uh, the length of the drawdown. So a uh, slow drawdown uh, within your wetlands um, where you're dropping the water levels periodically. If you do like drop it two inches every week, um, you're going to get a really good response. Uh, the wetland will be able to put to deposit uh, seeds uh, more evenly on a con slow controlled drawdown along the banks uh, than if you were to just completely drop all the water. Uh, it also helps uh, when raising water levels as well to do it gradual uh, so that those resources um, are dispersed throughout the season for birds. So those early migrants can get some and as you raise the water levels then um, more species will be able to continue uh, getting food. Um, so again, this is a very manipulated system and it's important to really work with landowners. Um, I understand and have dealt with uh, at least problems in Colorado where water rights is a, a big problem. Um, sometimes we don't have water when we want it or we don't have the ability to draw down. Um, so you just work on a case by case basis, but this is um, in the perfect conditions. This is what we would do. And I just wanted to show you some photos of what the different cover types by season would be. And um, up here in the top photo, this would be a picture of these wetlands in the fall. And it's really tall growth, but all those plants are producing seeds. Uh, below the water level, you're gonna get a lot of your invertebrate growth. And you can tell um, it's great cover for these birds as well. And then, uh, winter, all of this will typically degrade um, and it'll just look kind of barren and frozen. But come spring, the wetlands will fill back up and uh, turn into that bottom right hand photo. And um, throughout the spring, the water levels will slowly recede um, as you go down and it will deposit. If you can see pretty closely, there's a lot of snail shells there. And what looks like debris and just dirt um, is actually a ton of seeds. So those are those um, wetland plants, their seeds have been deposited on the shore. And as the season goes on and that wetland kind of dries out, it will grow into this bottom left hand corner picture, uh, which is a, a wetland full of smart weed. So, um, and that's exactly what we want and then come fall again, you'll flood it up and it'll look like that top picture. And that's uh, really your ideal uh, wetland habitat for producing forage. Um, extremely variable between seasons um, and over time. Uh, another important thing to share, uh, a lot of uh, landowners, even agency folks, think that you need like to, to dig out this deep pond of water for waterfowl. But in reality, if you look at this uh, figure, these birds really like their water to be less than 12 inches deep. So these wetlands should be really shallow, seasonal um, and variable in depth throughout the season just to benefit your biggest variety of birds. And these are really focusing on dabbling bird species or um, shorebirds. And how I can assist these landowners um, is in the creation of these wetlands. Uh, we'll work with them to identify where to put wetlands, if their soils are correct, um, if they have water out there, if they need water, 
Um, water rights, again, is a really big factor in this. Um, it just may not be possible because they don't have water rights um, or their water rights don't match with what we want to do out there. Um, then we work with partners, whether it be the Natural Resources Conservation Service or Ducks Unlimited, anybody who has the resources to draw up designs for wetland projects. Um, and we work on designing berms, uh, water control structures, and this is really what controls uh, how deep the wetland is and how slowly you are able to drain that water. Um, and some important points in restoration uh, or creation is really what I should call it, is it, keep it shallow again. Um, the birds only need 12 inches. I wouldn't go much deeper than that. And uh, gradual slopes so that you can really evenly deposit the wetland seed along the banks. And a lot of people think that you have to seed these wetlands, but it's not actually necessary in most cases. Your ditches and canals uh, already hold a lot of the seed that you would need. So just by using your irrigation water, uh, you can create these systems uh, without spending lots of money on seed. And then place your water control structure at the lowest point. And this makes it so you can um, completely drain these ponds. They are seasonal. They're supposed to dry out periodically. Uh, it'll keep cattail from growing and really allow you to uh, manage it. And here's an example of a project that I've been working on. Right, uh, the green boundary shows an existing pond and it's created conditions for all those birds on the left. That's an actual picture from this wetland uh, in early spring and uh, uh, it's really been a highly productive wetland. Uh, it's also serves in a, as an, uh, excuse me, an augmentation pond. Uh, so we've got dual uses here, uh, really valuable. And it's working out so well that we are going to create another one down where that blue boundary is. So we're working in partnership with NRCS and Ducks Unlimited uh, to plan an entirely new wetland out there. So really excited to see that. I'll try to at least double the acreage. Uh, here's another restoration that we have worked on. Um, this kind of points into the fact water rights, this wetland system, they have very strict water, so they are not able uh, to have water at all during the winter and they have to have it very late into the spring. So this is it completely dried out in the winter time. Um, it just gets some seep from uphill uh, reservoirs. So there's a little water in the ditch, but then here it is filled up in the springtime and it provides amazing uh, forage opportunities for those migratory birds as well. So we see a lot of use here, really valuable. Um, at, these systems really do work well. And all of this information that I've talked about, you could go into way more depth with it um, in the Waterfowl Management Handbook. Uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service has produced it. I'll post a link to the PDF in the chat box after this. Um, I would also like to say if you have the opportunity to um, go to a training from the Wetland Management and Educational Services, uh, Lee Fredrickson and Adonia Henry, Henry uh, put on these workshops. We've had multiple here in Colorado. I've gone to two different ones and they're extremely valuable uh, learning about the needs of birds and how to create their habitats for them. And in conclusion, I'd just like to say thank you to all the partners that really make wetland habitat restoration and management possible in our area. Um, it's been great and, uh, and valuable uh, and the landowners really appreciate it as well. So if you have questions, I'll be around later. Okay, thank you, Kelsey. We really appreciate that. Um, we will keep it moving on and uh, we'll welcome Nina Loudon from the Colorado Department of Agriculture's Palisade and Sectory. So go ahead and take it away, Nina. All right, 
So um, my name is Nina Loudon, and today I'll be talking about uh, biological control um, in Colorado with the Palisade Insectary. Um, the Palisade Insectary is a um, it's a branch under the Division of Conservation Services. Um, so, oh, and I can turn on my screen. I don't mind. Turn on camera. Um, okay, there we go. Oh. Okay, so anyway, um, we are a um, division under Conservation Services. And let me show you um, a slide of the insectary. Um, this is back in the 40s. So the insectary um, came from very humble beginnings. You can see it was just a, a basically a farmhouse um, where they first begin rearing um, the first bio, biocontrol project. So the insectary has been around for quite a while. Um, currently, we are very fortunate to have a, a nice facility. It's roughly 13,000 square feet. We have around 1,200 square feet of greenhouse. Um, we currently have uh, six full-time employees, um, not to mention many um, seasonal, uh, much seasonal staff to help every summer because we are busiest then um, due to insects being um, out in full force and collecting and redistributing. Um, so uh, summer picks up. Um, so what is biological control? Uh, most of you know, of course, that uh, this is a tool in integrated pest management. It is a way to control further spread of pest species through the use of their natural enemies. So pretty basic idea to use the um, insect specialists that feed on specific uh, invasive non-native species um, use those natural enemies against them to um, produce um, less dense invasions and um, stop further spread. So it's really cost effective once they establish and really ecologically um, safe um, if uh, you can get the agents going, get them in that system, have them establish. It's a really um, safe and cost-effective way to control um, non-native invasives. Um, so let's look um, at some specific cases. But before I do that, I will say it's not um, always useful, of course, just like um, all the different um, types of uh, integrated pest management. Some are more, more useful in certain um, habitats as opposed to others. If eradication is your goal, this, this isn't for you. We generally do not see eradication. These natural enemies, these insects will control further spread in ideal situations, um, but they um, rarely ever um, eradicate a, a plant from the system, which ma completely makes sense really because it's their host species. They do need some of that host to continue feeding. Um, so of course, that's that's somewhat expected. And um, and so if you're hoping to just mechanically remove all of a, a stand of tamarisk, for instance, or you want to chemically treat uh, weed species and get it out of the system, do reveg, um, that might uh, that wouldn't include um, in, uh, using biocontrol and in that regard. So it depends on, it's a case by case basis. But let me give you some examples where we do see really good success. And uh, the first one would be the MAC um, project. This is a, a parasitoid wasp that is reared every year at the insectary. Um, roughly 1.5 million are released um, every year. So this is a really, um, a big project for all of us in the summer. Um, it is really important to the insectary because the insectary was founded around this project. So back in 1945, this is the wasp they reared in that uh, farmhouse I showed you earlier. So um, we continue to rear these um, to this day because um, it is a augmentative control, meaning that um, we 
they will not establish. So um, we release yearly and we trap yearly to um, uh, check if they are keeping the moth levels low and they are attacking the oriental fruit moth. I probably didn't say that earlier, but they do attack this oriental fruit moth and um, kill the larvae. They uh, insert their eggs in the larvae of the moth. And so um, you can see here the stacks of potatoes. We um, rear uh, an, actually an alternate host because this is a close relative to the oriental fruit moth. We rear them in potatoes and that way we can rear the millions of mac wasps we need that are then put out in the peach orchards um, every summer. So that's a look at the mac project, the first project here. Um, currently, we work um, a lot with tamarisk leaf beetles. These are a really notable biocontrol because, um, as probably a lot of people know, they've been quite successful here in western Colorado. Um, unfortunately, they're not doing as well in eastern Colorado. Um, granted, we did hear some good news from um, Shelly Simmons this year that she picked up some establishment um, near Honey. So, we are really happy to hear that because there is such, there are um, literally uh, just, you know, um, I think it's, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the approximation of acreage of tamarisk there, but it's far outnumbers the tamarisk infestation here in Western Colorado. Um, but despite that, we um, are really pleased with how well they have done here in Western Colorado. They were initially released in 2005, and since that time, they've um, uh, literally defoliated hundreds of acres here in Western Colorado, and um, we're really, really happy to report they continue to successfully um, defoliate tamarisk stands um, on uh, the Colorado River and tributaries. And you can see the sites throughout Colorado on the map, the bottom center. So we do have quite a, a, a lot of sites that we currently monitor. Um, we are unfortunately, as I mentioned, not having as much success in Eastern Colorado, but we hope that will pick up. Um, here is a look at the um, larvae form of the, of the diarabda beetle. So um, they develop through three instars of, um, of larvae or sizes of larvae and uh, these are the voracious feeders. They're what really like defoliate and brown out the trees. And you can see this really nice distinctive defoliation. This is, these are sites along um, the Dolores River um, near Bedrock and Gateway, Colorado, and the really star sites of, um, of the tamarisk beetle um, in action. They've done a great job of um, defoliating over consecutive years there. So. Um, we like to showcase uh, the Dolores River and um, a lot of other um, um, work has been done. So really want to thank uh, the Dolores River Restoration Partnership as well because they've um, uh, used some other um, removals and uh, a lot of people and groups have, have worked, coalesced and worked on the Dolores and it really shows it's looking really good. Um, so. Also, Salt Creek in Mesa County um, is a great example of our tamarisk beetles have defoliated and uh, um, really performed well, really good example of biocontrol in action. And we've seen as high as 50% um, tree mortality at our best sites. So um, it's, um, uh, it's, it's nice to have results like that. Um, granted, uh, that's, you know, at our best sites, it's still half the tamarisk is um, viable and living. And um, sometimes to the eye, you think, oh, it's all dead. But no, we've, we've uh, noted that uh, most often it, a lot is is alive. And but what's important is what what remains um, has uh, been measured to have significant dieback. So even if the tree is alive. Um, so much of the branches have um, actually died on those living trees that it's really physically opened up an area for other plants to come in and thrive. Um, granted, 
you need those plants in the system. So it's really site dependent. If you have other invasives there, um, you, you would likely see more of those come up. But um, in certain cases, we do have some um, uh, good native vegetation coming in where um, the tamarisk has been pushed back. So it's nice to see that. And we've reached around 57 percent uh, dieback on average. So that's a really good good result. Um, so uh, in summary, uh, reductions to canopy or just the continual um, defoliation of the leaves has resulted in a significant dieback. And we have recorded tree mortality at nine out of 12 sites in Western Colorado. Um, and we, we are real happy to report that that is giving us some, some long-term control against further spread of tamarisk. Um, once you have beetle establishment, that's the, that's a trick. So here's just a nice um, visual of some of the healthier plants. We see some of the native vegetation we hope um, sites will have and that um, we can see slowly return. And we are um, taking some measurements of that as well. And uh, another really positive um, impact once you have beetle establishment is return of groundwater. And that has been um, measured and uh, um so and documented so great result mm -hmm. when you get that biocontrol to establish so unfortunately john martin reservoir isn't a good example of um, having them established but we're working hard um, there to get more um, beetles out and work um in uh uh i guess in partnership with the uh, many folks there's so many people to thank that have um help to get beetles um, over to Eastern Colorado and, and hope that they will establish once more. They were starting to establish pretty well for several years. And so we're just pushing hard to hope for that once more. But I'm taking too much time on tamarisk beetles and I wanna move over to field bindweed. And um, this is a really, really highly requested um, uh, biocontrol. So um, it's, I'd say, one of our most requested um, biocontrol agents um, because field bindweed is so common and almost uh, most homeowners have it and would like help. And so we have a microscopic mite that we ship um, to landowners throughout the state. Um, we shipped around 800 releases out this summer. So they are a very popular biocontrol agent, and they really do um, help to decrease the spread of field bindweed. Um, they live in the tissue of the plant, and they will um, stunt the plant in a really distinctive way. Their damage is very distinctive, as you can see on the bottom uh, right. And we release these June through August, and um, we um, we've been, gotten much better, I would say, at explaining to people what to look for, to know if they've established or not. And um, the first sign is the leaves will fold and the, the midrib behind that leaf gets really swollen. As you can see in that uh, photo with the circled leaf there, you, you get really distinctive damage occurring from the mite infestation. Once you start to see this, you can actually pull the damaged plants and move them to other um, healthy plants on your property. So we really promote that as well to start, you know, for individuals that request these, this biocontrol to, to start their own nursery. That's the goal, get establishment and spread them further. And um, we um, have some good results from Utah. Um, they, uh, Amber Mendenhall with uh, APHIS in Utah has um, reported roughly 60% decrease in um, three years with mite establishment. So that's a pretty good result. We're setting up transects here in Colorado um, to get um, uh, some more hard evidence of how they're doing here in our state. And they seem to be doing well. Um, if uh, how many we've collected and redistributed is any indication, they do seem to do well here in our state. Um, we also work with uh, musk thistle rosette weevils. I'm going to, I think, speed up a little bit because I, I think I have quite a bit more to cover, but um, we have a rosette 
thistle um, weevil and um, for uh, musk thistle, he's our specialist and like our other biocontrols and they attack and live and grow. Um, they grow inside the root of the musk thistle and granted musk thistle is um, biennial, biennial, so it's not one of our worst invasive non-natives. Um, if you are able to um, cut, cut the seeds, um, um, you know, consistently, you can, you can get a handle on it. And a lot of people prefer to, to spray this one, just get it, get it out uh, off their property entirely. Um, but if you're just inundated and you have more than you can handle, these weevils are a good um, option. And um, you can see they stunt the plant on the middle photo there. They really stunt and damage the plants through time and eventually um, can, uh, uh, good numbers of weevils can result in a really significant decrease in um, the thistle patch. So this is a nice example of, uh, of their work in several years. Thank you, John Kaltenbach, for these great before and after photos. So this is a good example of how well they can do. So this is um, Cherry State, uh, Cherry Creek State Park. And, um, nice to see that. Um, next, I'll talk about the toad flaxes. Um, we have weevils for either yellow toad flax or Dalmatian toad flax. So each uh, species of toad flax has a separate species of weevil that will um, feed on it and live within the stems. They develop within the stems. And um, we uh, are currently um, uh, working to get more uh, the, of the yellow toad flax and weevils um, growing and out. So we are just struggling a little bit to get enough of these um, to get enough uh, of what we would like to see out to everyone. So we want to get more nurseries and get more of these out. Um, um, but uh, yes, that's in the works. <laughs> so we'll continue to work with these. They seem to work pretty well when you once again, once you get them established. So um, I'll also mention the Dalmatian toad flax weevil. Um, it has shown to, to work really well um, when you're using biocontrol for Dalmatian toad flax. If that's the type of toad flax you have, you're in luck because these um, weevils seem to really, really help. And a great example of that effort um, would be the Poudre River site. Um, uh, it's um, a, uh, a site, uh, it's actually a collection of sites that was set up following the burn, the Hewlett and High Park fires in 2012. And um, Mike Reset, who works on this project, he um, and also Dr. Jan Bean, the supervisor here, they really, it was a real, uh, really large joint effort. Um, also John Kaltenbach out of um, the Denver, Denver office for the CDA, he um, helped um, a lot with this as well. And also Steve Ryder um, to coordinate um, many entities working together on the Colorado State Land Board, um, the USDA um, private landowners as well to um, release these weevils over approximately 600 acres. So really widespread releases were performed in 2013 and 14. And here's a map of um, the release sites, the monitoring sites are in yellow. So, um, and this is above um, Fort Collins and um, um, we are really proud of the results here. So um, following that burn and all the, um, the outbreak of uh, Dalmatian toad flax, really um, good results with um, the release of these weevils in several years. So nice to see that, some native vegetation um, coming in, some good grasses, and we'll continue to measure um, those results. And I am about out of time, so quickly I'll just mention we also work with the rust fungus for uh, pardon Canada thistle, so this time a, a specialist fungus, and we're just working hard uh, to get uh, more fungus in and Karen Rosen, who works on this project, has done a great job of setting up um, sites throughout the state. 
and she's currently um, shipping this fungus out to um, landowners all over the state in hopes to get more out there um, and spread and and uh, to continue to measure further decline of Canada. This is one of our most globally costly um, weed invaders, so a nasty weed, of course, and um, hoping to get more out. And um, I know I'm out of time, but Sonia Daly is also um, doing a great job here of getting um, both a gall fly and a gall wasp out on Russian um, knapweed, which again, another uh, just really noxious, um, non-native invasive that is trouble for so many landowners. So getting more and more of these out. And currently Mike's working on puncture vine weevils. Those are going out. Here is a price breakdown. So you can see um, the relative cost is low for biocontrol. So that's a, a good, um, re uh, um, uh, I guess, reason to possibly use these and give them a try um, when that the goal is um, to control further spread and you would rather not use herbicide or mechanical removal is impossible. Um, these are a good um, tool to try and Colorado is really progressive in funding and um, promoting biocontrol. So we're lucky to live here and be able to um, get these be funded to um, collect and redistribute these agents. So visit um, our website to get more information or um, request a bug if you're interested. And thank you all. Thank you. I really want to thank Rivers Edge West too for putting um, these talks together. It's very um, nice to uh, get information out to everyone. So thank you. And um, yeah, thank you all. All right. Great. Thank you, Nina. Um, fantastic information. Um, appreciate all the information from all the presenters. Uh, we have a list of questions growing. So I think we'll just move directly into the question and answer session. Um, so a reminder for everyone, if you have questions, check on the bubble um, bubble icon in the top right in the chat box and enter those questions in and uh, we'll start in. So I think the first one is for you, Kelsey. Uh, do you, uh, in the areas that you were talking about in your presentation, do you fence them off from cattle? Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, cattle can really uh, damage the berms and the structures out there, so we try and keep them out, but we have used them uh, within the wetland before to create some disturbance, because in these systems it's nice every three-ish years to maybe disc them up or um, stir up that seed bank, so uh, cattle can do that for you as well but as long as you keep them off the banks that's really important all right thank you um nina how dense does the tamara stand need to be to uh to uh try the beetles or establish beetles do you have a, a general um density i i i don't have an exact density no um but i would recommend you would want at least uh, probably 20 or so trees, like at least, I would say at least half an acre or more to really justify a beetle release. Um, in most cases, I think um, landowners um, kind of need to depend on beetles already established in the area. Um, so that's when you'll see most significant results is when there's really um, a huge population like as in Western Colorado, where um, they're just thriving and um, they'll move into your area naturally. Um, we can release satellite populations and kind of pull them in as they do release like a pheromone, um, but it really helps if there's good numbers already established on large um, infestations near that landowner. Okay, great. Um, Nina, do you have any biological controls for wheat stem sawfly? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> no. We get asked a lot about other um, biocontrols and we wish we had more, but no, we, we don't for that one. Okay. Um, for the gall mite, is there a minimum acreage needed uh, for, for a release? Um, I, we release in roughly a 10 foot by 10 foot area, um, uh, the starter colony, 
So you would, I mean, that's not very large. I would, I would hope there's more, more than that um, present to um, justify doing a biocontrol. If you have less than roughly, you know, 10 foot by 10 foot, you probably want to go after it and just eradicate it out, pull it. Um, but if you have at least 10 foot by 10 foot area and want to try the biocontrol, that would be sufficient. Okay. Um, is the um, field bindweed mite available and being released in other states? Oh, yeah, that's a great question because we wish um, there were more um, insectaries, rather, uh, whether private or state funded, out there to collect these because there is such high demand. Um, we, we really can't ship out of state because demand is just too high within our own state to keep up. Um, but um, we really promote um, other institutions out of state to um, start rearing. We have worked with APHIS out of Wyoming and um, Nebraska to ship mites for them to start uh, nurseries and potentially um, collect and redistribute. So I guess I would say um, contact your um, uh, county weed manager and just see if there are any efforts in place to get the mites going. And if not, then they could, that uh, weed manager could contact us and we could ship to them to potentially start a nursery because um, there is a strong demand to get more out of the state. Okay. Um, one more for you, Nina. How far south can musk thistle we weevil live? Oh, <laughs> um, they have been shipped um, to southern Colorado um, as far as, uh, gosh, um, I know the San Luis Valley has, has I think, had some um, present and uh, per, uh, potentially like Trinidad, um, Cortez, but I'm not sure beyond our state. Beyond Colorado. Okay. Uh, Kelsey, uh, has there been much success transforming weedy areas into wetlands, specifically Kosha? Um, I think it's really going to depend on the soils, what will hold water, um, and Kosha seems to grow everywhere. So um, I think there could be success. And even within these wetlands, if kosher did grow within them, uh, although they're not ideal, they will um, produce a lot of invertebrates within their growth as well. So they can be useful if flooded too. So. Okay. Great. Um, we do have um, we do have a comment that we wanted to just kind of point out there in the chat box. Uh, Kai, thank you for bringing this up. But uh, there are some biological controls that that can't be moved interstate, uh, particularly the tamarisk leaf beetle, um, uh, because of some of the impacts to uh, uh, native species, native bird, avian species. Uh, so um, please consult your state um or or uh or or the like uh, agency to see what what the rules are for biological controls nina do you have anything else to add on that um but yeah that's um worth mentioning um and kind of um made me uh think of something else to address as far as um where these agents will work they they typically work wherever the weed can invade because they are co-evolved with those those host weeds so on that musk thistle question, they typically can live wherever that host weed can live. Um, but yes, the point that, that we can't move them out of state depending on what agent it is, is um, completely correct. Um, some are permitted out of state a lot, um, some aren't. So it's really dependent on which biocontrol it is. Um, and uh, typically we do primarily work within our state as we are a CDA at Colorado Department of Ag. So we're primarily funded to work in Colorado. So if you're out of state, uh, unfortunately, we um, probably we might not be able to help you out. So yes, good point. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Shelly, just, just a quick question for you. Um, I, I believe that you guys had a real successful uh, good, good neighbor program. Could you just very quickly kind of describe that that program and and how that had had impacts on on uh, you know neighboring properties and uh, 
um, and, and working in close proximity with other landowners. You still with us, Shelly? Shelly might not be with us, so. Um, um, let's see here. Uh, do you, um, so I think this may be for Nina, um, maybe a, a, a policy implementation question. So we'll, we'll try this. Uh, any <laughs> recommendations for promoting and making your region more open to biocontrol? Uh, working in Southern California, it just isn't a popular idea. Yet herbicides also are becoming unpopular with the public. So, um, you know, I, I, I guess that's a, that's a big question, but uh, any, any, any leads there that you might have on that? Um, I guess my best recommendation would be to to get into contact with your government officials, even um, locally, you know, the county weed managers and um, and then your state, you know, weed management programs and just voice your opinion that you, you do wish for biocontrol um, implementation. And uh, I know there are some private insectaries, so on um, some of those agents that are permitted, to cross state lines, you know, you can look into private insectaries um, if you would uh, try um, to try some of the biocontrols, but also just, yeah, just um, squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know, just um, public outreach is great to um, let people know that you, you know, there is more there, that biocontrol really is gaining interest. All right. Well, um, I think that's all of our questions that we have um, in the uh, in the chat box. So again, I'd love to thank uh, Shelly, Nina, and and Kelsey for their presentations. Thank you for uh, for all the information. It's very good. Uh, just a reminder: we will have a recording of this presentation up on our website. You can go to that link that I sent earlier in the chat box to access those recordings. Um, thank you all for joining us today for uh, our webinar series. Uh, we really appreciate your time and taking out of your day to spend with us. Um, consider becoming a member of River's Edge West. Uh, that funding really helps us put on these webinar series and provide people information uh, to really uh, affect their, their restoration areas. Or sign up for a newsletter. There's lots of funding opportunities, lots of resources in that uh, newsletter. So with that, Thank you uh, presenters and thanks everyone and have a great day.